Hi, I'm David Penn, Research Analyst with Finnovate. We're here at Finnovate Europe and at London, England. And joining me now is John C. Holzman. He is the President and Managing Partner of John C. Holzman Enterprises. John, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure to be here, David. Great. I thought before we could get started, you could tell us just a little bit about your organization for those who might not be familiar. We're one of the world's larger political risk firms, and what mm. we do is provide geopolitical advice, the weather that everyone invests in for banks, hedge funds, and, and only secondarily governments. Interesting, interesting. Well, one of the things I wanted to talk with you about a little bit today is technology, specifically artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, a lot of things we're talking about here at Finnovate Europe in particular, and we're curious about some of the opportunities that you see in terms of the easier things that might be accomplished and easier opportunities within both AI and machine learning. Well, I mean, from our point of view, it isn't easy. The problem is that you've got a cold war here between the Chinese and the Americans about AI. I mean, mm -hmm. they, that's not easy at all. That I, I, I care more about that, mm -hmm. that this is just another form of geopolitical uh, contest, mm. which has been around since the Greeks and the Persians. You know, this isn't new, <laughs> right. but, but this is the latest thing that's part of it. Rather than it being new, and I keep hearing the word new, it's not. It's very old. Mm. It's just the latest thing that matters. And yes, indeed, it matters that most of our chips are made in Taiwan, which is the cockpit, the Berlin of the new Cold War. Mm. I mean, that matters as AI does, but the interesting thing is that the Chinese are throwing billions of dollars at research here, mm. but they lack the innovative skills to really make the most of that. The Americans, as always, have been taking a nap and are waking up late to the game, mm -hmm. but they have a number of the, they have the background to really make up the distance. Right. And so the outcome isn't clear at the moment, but this must be seen as part of the larger Cold War and vying for power in the world, I think. It's really interesting, and I've heard some very interesting conversations about China and the United States vis-a-vis -vis AI, and one of the things that I've heard has to do with the fact that while China's investing a lot of, of, of money, obviously, in AI, there are uh, cultural and political aspects about the growth of AI and the things that AI can do that might be problematic with the Chinese Communist Party, for example. How do you see that? Do you think that's a, a valid, uh, certainly not something that we can't not be concerned about, but is that going to be a problem for China as they develop AI? It is, because mm -hmm. the problem is that innovation requires freedom. <laughs> at, at some level, you, you know, that scientists have to be free, and, and even in the work that, that our firm does, it's more of an art than a science, political risk. If you're right eight times out of ten, it is profound and grounded in reality, right. but, you, but you have to be free to make mistakes. You have to be free to learn from mistakes. You have to be free to do that, and in a totalitarian system, you're not ever allowed to make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. Witness what happened to Chernobyl. The fact <laughs> is that everyone knew what was going on, but no one could tell the truth. Witness what happened even with COVID breaking out. I assume the mm. story would have been very similar at some level. Nobody could tell the truth to the powers that be. That is a bad way to innovate. Absolutely. For all the problems in the democratic West, for all the bumbling of the United States and the West, we are an open free society where you're allowed to make, where R&D is all about making mistakes right. and learning from them. And nobody gets very upset mm -hmm. if something does that. That's merely part of the process. And that gives us this un, un, un thought of advantage. So yes, you can be Orwellian and say yes, the Chinese can use facial recognition techniques to give everyone a social score and this is Orwellian and scary, but on the other hand, in terms of innovating and winning this contest in the long run, give me freedom every time. Yeah, absolutely. I just think of some of the things that uh, people are doing with sort of the relatively rudimentary sorts of AI that we've got now, that's accessible to the average person, and trying to imagine it. You're not going to see a lot of limericks about President Premier Xi, for example, <laughs> um, coming across, or generative images, for example, of him and Winnie the Pooh coming, yeah. popping up in China. And those are the sorts of things that, once you let that technology loose, people are going to start doing things with it. That's it, is mm. that once you, once you let the genie out of the bottle, and this has always been the problem, to go up that last step of the value chain for the CCP. That's a broader argument of which AI is a fundamental part, mm -hmm. to do that you need to loosen up society and the big question has been since Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. can you loosen up society economically without there being pluralism and political ramifications to that? Our bet in the long run is no. Right. Yes, for decades maybe, but not forever. Mm -hmm. And our bet is that to make the most of it, you'll allow, the Communist Party will have to reach a moment or a series of moments probably mm -hmm. where they either say we will keep opening up society, whatever the result, or we'll clamp down on society. Well, if they clamp down on it, they don't get the benefits of it. AI. And so there'll be this key moment, or a series of them, where they might not have to make a Rubicon moment, but where they're going to have to make some fundamental choices. Yeah, it's really an interesting aspect of it. I don't think it's appreciated enough from people in that, in that conversation. Again, you mentioned their response to COVID, and the, most recently, the, the dramatic reversal that they had to make. It's an example of the kind of things where they can find themselves a bit
Mr. Bullock, stop. Yeah. And really having to figure out this is not going to work. We're going to have to go in a different direction, even if in the short term or the foreseeable term, it's going to be extremely uncomfortable for us. It is. And the problem is that along the way, no one tells them they're wrong. And I mean, I, I know that this is a key part of policy making. Yeah. You learn every day. You make course corrections, small ones every day. And if you're not allowed to make them, then as the Chinese did over COVID, you have to, from the zero COVID policy, you have to make big ones right. where you have to climb down in front of the whole world and everyone knows that you lose face. Whereas if you just have a trial and error approach to freedom day to day, that's just part of the business of being alive. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the points you mentioned about uh, Chernobyl, I just happened to be watching the miniseries again, uh, maybe for the third time. Just fantastic, fantastic program. And uh, that first episode where they just we really kind of get that sense of we could tell the truth or we could do what we do, yeah. and they do what they do. And it's not really in our interest to tell the truth, and we kind of like to, but we won't. Exactly. And, and, and that's built into that system, is that if you can't admit fault, if you can't admit, whereas our congressional system is setting up committees. I mean, the first thought I had when the Republicans took the House, there'll be an investigative committee on Hunter Biden, there'll be an investigative committee mm -hmm. on COVID, there'll be an investigative committee on Dr. Fauci, as there should be, whether they're right or wrong, or good or bad, or mm -hmm. innocent or not, the job of the Congress is to investigate what the executive branch does, whoever's in. Right. And and that keeps us all honest, whoever side you are on. Mm -hmm. And that makes you make better decisions over time by looking at lessons learned. They don't do any of that. <laughs> by a long shot. By a long shot. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge advantage. It seems awful, our system in the paper every day, you think, oh, we're right. investigating this problem. And you don't see that about them. But as you say, then they have these terrible climb downs because they haven't done the due diligence all the way along. Yeah, it's really some, something else. I'm thinking in terms of looking uh, specifically at the United States and the potential for uh, adoption of these technologies, AI, machine learning. What are some of the chief obstacles on our side of the, of, of the ocean, so to speak, to a broader embrace of some of these things? We have privacy issues to settle, of course, because mm -hmm. of the constitutional First Amendment nature of the country. <laughs> Um, the other big, so that's going to be a whole issue. Nobody's begun to work out the ethics of this or how this works yet. We're just beginning mm -hmm. to get there. And the technology is always is racing ahead of the politics, which right. is how America works generally. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Then the other thing is that a lot of this is done privately. It's not just government mm -hmm. processes as there are in China, where everything is pretty much run by the government. Right. Well, that's easy to keep track of in one sense. In, in America, you've got private enterprise always driving things. They're just different forms of capitalism. I mean, theirs is about state-owned enterprises. Ours is about private corporations making decisions and often making prickly decisions and not liking the government saying, but out. Right. Uh, you, you don't get to say about this. We have free enterprise. We have a First Amendment. We can do as we like. Mm -hmm. And so working out the new boundaries from this, it's not a problem, but it will take time. Right. And that will slow things down and that we will have to reach it. On the other hand, once we reach the societal convention through our Constitution, I think we tend to do very well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things perhaps that's going to have to, uh, to, to take place is going through some of those pains, as you mentioned, that the, the capacity to make stakes, the necessity of having to make yeah. stakes, and making sure that we uh, culturally uh, allow ourselves to make these mistakes and don't get derailed by thinking, didn't like that series of mistakes. When you stop the presses, we're not going to go any further, or we're going to dramatically slow down our, our attempt to go further. That's a great point. That it, that if you say because there's been a mistake, everything about AI is terrible. Right. You know, if you extrapolate to as Americans do to these ridiculous <laughs> positions, I mean that's wrong. It, this will be a process like every other new emerging technology. Mm -hmm. At first, I remember computers were going to change the world. This was the whatever, and then productivity didn't go up for about a decade and a half and no one could figure out why. Mm -hmm. Well, it took me, because I'm not very good at computers, that long mm -hmm. to figure out how to attach a document. Right. But once I did, then the productivity went up. But it didn't go up like some computer nerd who could do that in his garage could do that. You have to allow for human error. You have to allow for change to seep through a society, mm -hmm. particularly a free one. And so right. we have to be careful to not read one tiny set of numbers about AI and then extrapolate. This exactly. means it's all terrible. This means it's all wonderful. Right. I'm suspicious of anything being either Armageddon or a utopia. I mean, both tend not to be true <laughs> in my line of work. That's <laughs> really true. I think it's one of the interesting things I've been hearing about some of the more uh, thoughtful uh, presentations that a lot of the times what you have is this first iteration of something, the dot coms, Bitcoin, whatever, and it does a certain sort of thing, reaches a certain sort of level, then there's a collapse or a retrenchment, and then the trick is not to overplay that collapse or retrenchment to think that it's the end of it. It might simply be the process, the cycle that needs to happen for new players, new entrants, or as you mentioned yourself with, with computers, people simply catch up with the technology. No, I, think, I think, again, Hegelianism makes sense. There's mm -hmm. a thesis and there's an antithesis and a new synthesis, Absolutely. and this is how learning works, and so when things 
go up, it doesn't mean it's invincible and we keep reading how everything's in. And when it goes wrong, it doesn't mean it's all terrible. Right. It means that we're working through the process of learning in a free society and this takes time and there will be a new synthesis and it will be profoundly important, but that we will still have to compete with the Chinese. Absolutely. Both, both are true. <laughs> right, they're not going anywhere. I think there's one last thing I just wanted to ask you about. We were, uh, we were joking, some of the folks were talking about how we had ChatGPT3 before the conference started and the conference isn't even over and now we have the version four and yeah. people talking about it and uh, I was reading somebody says it did great on the bar exam but not so great on AP English Lit, for example. Yeah. Um, when you see the way that, that uh, compared maybe to cryptocurrencies which had sort of an odd, uh, very financial oriented sort of role for a lot of people, are you heartened by the, the way that so many people seem to be genuinely excited about generative AI, that's something that you don't see some of the sort of uh, tentativeness you might have otherwise seen with new technologies? Well I do and I, and I like very much and I, I too heard that story that look, English Lit, it, it takes a certain amount of emotional complexity. Mm. That's what they have to learn over time. Mm -hmm. Whereas just making a sentence work, there's a verb, there's an adverb, they are in agreement. <laughs> That's true, but no one talks like they're an alien. <laughs> I am going to lunch now. You know, no one, no one says that. Right. It's how I speak Italian, very badly. <laughs> they understand what I'm saying, but there's not a whole lot of nuance to my Italian. I wish there were, but there's not. Right. In Milan, it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not, but, and I think that, that's a perfectly grown up way to look at it. This is already an amazing innovation, mm -hmm. that it can do what it can do is, is amazing, that that will help with like legal texts, which are dry as a bone, that's great. But it's probably not going to help them be Charles Dickens anytime <laughs> in the near future. It has to learn how to do that over time. That doesn't mean it's not worthwhile or it's worthless. Right. It means it's growing and learning. That's the whole point of AI. Exactly. That's what it's about. Yeah. And so we have to be patient mm -hmm. because it has to learn. And everyone who's done learning on their own, whether it be a machine or a human, that takes time. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, fantastic talk with you. I really enjoyed the conversation. And I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. <laughs>